All right. <clears throat> so picking up where we left off, now we're going to look at basically the enterprise DCF model. So this is just a graphical representation of an enterprise DCF. And the idea is if we forecasted the free cash flows of a firm, discounted and summed them up, and the firm didn't have any non-operating assets, that would become the enterprise value. And it's that enterprise value that we would pay to the debt and the equity holders. So if we paid off the debt cash flow, what's left would be the equity cash flow. So essentially, if I sum the debt cash flows, I get a debt value. If I sum the equity cash flows, I get an equity value. Debt and equity is the enterprise value, which is the sum of the operating cash flows. So assuming no non-operating assets. So again, we're going to be able to get granular with the forecast of each of the four areas. So an example of the firm and how this would apply is let's take a business that has three business units. So for example, I work with a company called Ingersoll Rand and Ingersoll Rand has three businesses. They have a heating and air conditioning business, they have a golf cart business, and they have a security business. So what I could do is I could value each of the three businesses separately, add them together, that's the value of Ingersoll Rand. They also have a corporate center in Davidson, North Carolina that doesn't generate revenue, but it's their senior leadership and all their shared services functions. I subtract out the cost center for the shared services, and then that becomes the operating value of the business. I then add in the non-operating value, any cash and joint venture assets that they have, and then that gets me the enterprise value. And then if I knew what their debt was, I subtract the debt, whatever's left is the equity value, and then divide by shares, share price. That is the process for enterprise DCF that we are going to go through. Okay. Now, what enterprise DCF is ultimately based on is free cash flow. When we forecast free cash flows, the one challenge we're going to have is that we're going to have to forecast free cash flows for a business forever. And that's going to be too difficult to do. So at some point in time, we're going to stop forecasting year by year. And we will have this explicit forecast period, which is the year by year forecast of the free cash flow. And then we'll forecast the long term free cash flows as a proxy using a continuing value period. And the continuing value formula that we're going to use is the key value drivers equation that we defined last week. Okay. So this is an example from the McKinsey book of Home Depot and the valuation that they had done for Home Depot. Under presentation mode here. This. Here we go. All right. <clears throat> so, this is actually a very important slide because when we build our valuation model next week in class, we're going to do an enterprise DCF valuation of the company and we're going to actually put into Excel a slide or an Excel worksheet that looks a lot like this slide. Okay. So <clears throat> this is exactly how McKinsey does their valuation, right? And they used Home Depot as an example. So here's the idea. Uh, the version of the textbook that we're using was written back in 2008. In fact, they're coming out with a sixth edition in January. And I was talking to one of the authors uh, last week, or this earlier this week, and uh, they're actually switching out the example to be UPS and FedEx. So that's going to be the example in the new book. Right? So in the old book, it was Home Depot and Lowe's. But <clears throat> in any event, what they did is they used Home Depot as the example. And based on the end of 2008, they were forecasting a value of Home Depot share price. So what they did is they predicted what the free cash flows of Home Depot were going to be for this defined value period. Each year, they forecasted the free cash flow. Okay. They then estimated a cost of capital, and they used 8.5% as their WAC. And then using an 8.5% WAC, they discounted the free cash flows to a present value. 
using the key value drivers formula starting in 2019, they estimated a continuing value for Home Depot. That was the 92239. <clears throat> the continuing value formula includes in it a implied discount rate. So that had actually discounted the cash flow for the continuing value to the beginning of 2019, January 1, 2019, which for all intents and purposes is the same as December 31st, 2018, which is why they had to then rediscount this back to a present value today. So this is the value of the year by year cash flows through 2018. This is the value of 2019 going forward. You add them up and that's called the operating value of the firm, 62694. So what they said is the value of people coming to Home Depot and buying stuff, the net cash profits, relative minus any investments that Home Depot had to make of those is worth about $62.694 billion okay, in present value terms. Now, the next step we are not going to do in this class, but I'd like, because sometimes we skip steps, but I wanted to at least let you know what, why we're skipping the step. And it's really just for simplicity, but it's not a bad step to consider doing. And then the other thing they do is they include in it what's called a mid-year adjustment factor, right? And so the idea is this, if I'm present valuing these cash flows and I discount the cash flow using the present value formula, the present value formula assumes that all the cash shows up at the end of the year, proxy December 31st. But Home Depot is not generating all of its cash profits on December 31st. People go to Home Depot every day. So Home Depot is generating cash profits every single day. So we are undervaluing Home Depot by assuming that all of the cash profits in a year happen at the very end of the year. So what McKinsey does to try and make up for that is they do a mid-year adjustment factor. So what they do is they take the entire operating valuation and they future value it by six months. They move it as if the value occurred not on January, January 1st, but June 30th. And the reason that they do that is it basically assumes that the cash flow is coming evenly throughout the year as opposed to all at the end of the year. And you can see that for Home Depot, that adds about $2.5 billion to their valuation from just a time value of money aspect in a limitation of applying the present value formula. So that's what this mid-year adjustment factor is all about. Yeah. So what they did was they moved the date to June rather than December, is that what you're saying? That's right. Well, you know, well, the valuation, the, they assumed the cash flows came in December, right. but they present valued it to January. Oh, June. No, to January originally. Oh. Like this 62694 right, right, right. is right. based on January, and then this future valuing of it moves it to June. So they moved everything six months into the future. Oh. So, and as I said, the, the assumption there is cash flows coming in evenly throughout right, the right, year, right. so they just moved it to the yeah. midpoint of the year. Exactly. And then if you really want to get granular, you can start saying, gee, what if I'm valuing a business like H&R Block? And H&R Block probably gets all of its revenue between January and April. They probably get very little revenue after April until the next tax season. So therefore, I need to do a, a, another adjustment factor that adjusts that way. So you can get very specific and it adjusts for the time value of money. But the reality is, in the real world, almost nobody does it. So I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. It conceptually, academically makes a lot of sense. But very, very few valuations outside of McKinsey have I ever seen somebody do this. So you go work for an investment bank, they're not going to ask you to do a mid-year adjustment factor. But it wouldn't be a bad exercise to actually talk about the concept because there is a limitation at work here from the present value formula where it is biasing the valuation a little bit. Yeah. You can apply the factor to the discount factor, right? You, you, to some degree, you could adjust the discount factor. It becomes a little bit harder to do, but yeah, you could. <clears throat> so they're just doing sort of discount it all and then future value at six months. I mean, you could play around with the discount factor to try and get something a little bit different. But because uh, that's the point, though, you don't want to do a six month discount factor for everything. You need to bring everything back to a present value. 
So yeah. that's what I said. It'd be harder to do it by adjusting the discount factor, but I'm sure theoretically you could. Yeah. If you future value it and then you add them both, it could be almost double, right? In the sense, if you have a hundred hundred dollar present value right now, and if you future value it, one year, but you're only going basically a half year's discount factor. So that's why you're only going with an eight and a half percent. You're only going a little over four percent into the future. Oh. Okay. So you're just basically adding four point whatever percent to the valuation. That's all you're doing. So you're just moving it forward six months. You're not moving every cash flow six months. You're moving the entire valuation six months. Okay. All right. <clears throat> but again, we're going to skip this step when we do our valuations for simplicity. Not saying you should, but just so you know. But here's the point. This is the operating value of Home Depot, assuming that the cash flows come true. What they then do is they add in the non-operating values. So they say, what are the major non-operating values? Well, excess cash. And this will be a key concept that we're gonna introduce this week, is that there's some cash which is operating and there's some cash which is excess. And we're gonna split the cash into the two. That you will learn probably in another class if you took corporate finance, the concept of net debt, right? Which net debt is debt minus cash. Right? Except net debt is great in an academic environment, but net debt doesn't work that way in the real world. Because in the real world, you can't take all of your cash and pay it to the bank. Like even if you went bankrupt, first the lawyers are gonna take a piece of that. And then the government's gonna come and take a piece of that. And then the employees are gonna take their unpaid wages. So there is no circumstance where all of that cash will go to the banks or the bondholders. So net debt is, is a little bit of a fallacy. It's a simplified way of, of looking at debt minus cash. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say that amount of cash that can't go to the banks is going to be called the operating cash. That's the cash that can never leave the business because it's going to be tied to the day-to-day -day running of the business. And even if the firm goes bankrupt, it's the cash that would then go to other people to pay their day-to-day -day claims before the bank gets paid. And that's why when a company goes bankrupt, a company doesn't go bankrupt when it has negative cash. A company goes bankrupt when it starts getting low on cash. Because at that point, it, the company ceases to function. So for example, a few years ago when General Motors went bankrupt, General Motors even said, $10 billion equals bankruptcy. Right? It wasn't zero, it was $10 billion. But if you're a $160 billion company, you need to have enough cash to make payroll, pay suppliers, whatever. And then when you get low, you start to cease to, to function. You know, same thing. Um, <clears throat> if you think about a, a hospital, I work with a lot of hospitals. 20 days of cash, I've been told by hospital controllers, is where a hospital would go bankrupt. Like when they start getting below 20 days of cash, they start having real trouble paying their bills. And that's when they start defaulting on their obligations. So it's never zero. Right? So what we have to do for a company is we have to figure out how much cash is operating and how much cash above that is discretionary and that's what we're going to call the excess cash. So <clears throat> the idea here is we look at the excess cash, non-operating, we look at long-term investments, joint venture in another business. So again, another good example of that would be Yahoo. You know, almost all the value of Yahoo today is the fact that they happened to have bought a stake in Alibaba a few years ago. <clears throat> so again, they don't run Alibaba, but they get a lot of value by owning that stake in Alibaba. Non-operating investment, long-term investment, has value. And tax loss carry forwards would be an example. So <clears throat> I lost some money, the government gives me future refunds, I haven't used them. Could be a value in the future of the business. So you basically add these non-operating assets to the operating assets and that gets you what's called enterprise value or EV for short right and this is the cash flow available to the debt and the equity holders so that's the next point we look at the value of the debt okay so the value of the debt on the balance sheet this is the interest bearing debt at the time of Home Depot was 11.4 billion dollars right but this next piece is what's the interesting thing what McKinsey says is you have to subtract what they call the debt and the debt equivalents, right? And what I would like to call the debt equivalents is the hidden debt, right? Is that companies are really good at having off balance sheet debt. And those are obligations that would have to be paid before the shareholders get paid. And it can be hard to figure out what these are unless you read the footnotes to the financial statements.
So a good example of this is leases. So operating leases don't show up on the balance sheet. They only show up in the footnotes. And Home Depot leases a lot of its stores. So one of the things McKinsey did is they tried to estimate the value of those operating leases and a present value that would have to be paid out. So in addition to $11.4 billion of debt on the balance sheet, they had $8.3 billion of debt off the balance sheet. The two together, $46 billion is left after they've been paid out. Right? That's the value to the shareholders. We then divide by shares outstanding, 1.7 billion shares outstanding, that gave us $27 a share. That's basically an enterprise DCF valuation. Okay. Now, just to give you a sense of this, <clears throat> if I open up a browser and I go to Google Finance or Yahoo Finance as an example and I look up Starbucks and I go to their financials and I go to their balance sheet I like Google Finance because it's easy and it's free if you're just looking for just some basic data but also because one of the features on their balance sheet is they actually include a line item called total debt where they've actually added the short and the long-term debt together so here's the total debt here's the total equity for Starbucks total debt two billion dollars two oh four eight okay capital lease obligations zero so Assuming that we had the enterprise value of Starbucks, we subtract off the total debt, and then we get an equity value, right? Except, here's the thing. If I go to www.sec.gov, then this is the SEC website, and they have a database called the Edgar Database, which I can get under company filings and I'll search for Starbucks <clears throat> so that within a day of a company filing with the SEC then all of their filings are available here online so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back here to their 10k their most recent 10k file, filed on uh, November 2013 and I'll go here to the documents and I'll click on the HTML version and this is Starbucks 10k it's 85 pages of sleep medication <laughs> I, I think there's an art to writing these things you basically just write it in a way that it's just non understandable but people are really good at putting data that's kind of hidden in that's where you bury the bodies in this kind of you know non-understandable language so here's what I mean by this let's just say I do a quick search and I search for um, lease which also is going to include please so there's 57 of them so I search for lease and I go to the next view blah 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 and I come to page 15 under this uh, table and there's this innocuous sentence but it's actually a very important sentence and what it says is we own our roasting facilities and lease the majority of our warehousing and distribution locations as of September 29th Starbucks had 10,194 company owned stores almost all of which are leased we also lease space in various locations worldwide for administrative offices so basically Starbucks is telling you if you bother to read the bottom of page 15 that they don't really own anything they pretty much lease everything and the reason why that's important is if we keep searching we come to this table on slide 37 where it basically says that Starbucks has four and a half billion dollars <coughs> 
of operating lease obligations that they can't get out of. Non-cancelable operating lease obligations. Where's that on their balance sheet? Exactly. So Starbucks, which has, I don't remember how many shares outstanding Starbucks has. They have 750 million shares, approximately, <clears throat> and they had, call it four and a half billion dollars of leases. That's about five or six dollars a share that we're going to misprice Starbucks on unless we bother to read the footnotes. Right? And that's what I mean by debt equivalence, is that in today's world, companies have become more sophisticated and they realize that they can do leasing and there's not just a tax benefit to leasing, there is also a hidden debt benefit to leasing where non-sophisticated investors will just look at the debt on the balance sheet and they won't look in the footnotes and they won't equate uh, essentially about $5 a share worth of debt that we would have to associate with finance. And that's something that we obviously will be doing this semester. So again, that's just an example of what I would call the debt equivalent obligations that we have to be looking for. Yeah. So, so I understand the balance sheet piece, but can you help me understand why it's not duplicative, as in it's already implied in the free cash flow? Well, no. The free cash flow, and that's the whole point of free cash flow, it's before the debt and equity financing. But it's not. It's not before those operating leases because they're buried in that cash flow. The only thing that's buried in the cash flow is the um, portion of the operating lease that's actually being paid. None of the future cash flows of those operating leases are there. Well, they, I mean, they would be if you maintain a projection of current year free cash flows, which are burdened by those operating costs. Yeah. The operating leases. So as you forecast that, you're not dropping off that operating cost. It's still buried there. Okay. So I'm, I'm just a bit confused why it wouldn't be duplicative well, in those places. <coughs> and one of the things it that... It feels punitive to me. To the, it's to not... The well, you're, it's a good point. And one of the reasons why it is going to be not punitive is the other thing that we're also trying to do is we're trying to strip out that cost from the operations. So when we rearrange the cash flows, we're going to take the financing cost of the leases out of free cash flow because it shouldn't be part of free cash flow. It's financing. So that's the other reason why it's not going to be duplicative. So, so what I'm saying is we're going to rearrange the statements coming up. And when we rearrange the statements, the only thing there is going to be operating. Any financing cost. So the interest cost and the leases, technically, we're rearranging. We're moving it to financing because it's like interest expense on the debt. So that's why that's we have to. That's on balance sheet costs, though. As in that, like, it's that not. financing is on the balance sheet. It's not, though. That's what I'm saying. In an operating lease, if I lease a car, right? And, and so, like, I do a three year lease on a car, almost all of my leasing payment is implied interest on the car, right? But what I'm saying is, if I leave it all in there, I've mixed the interest, the implied interest, and the principal. But what we're going to do is we're going to take that implied interest that's in the lease, that's financing. We're taking it out of the free cash flow calculation because anything that's debt is not part of free cash flow. And so therefore, that interest expense on the lease shouldn't be part of free cash flow. we got to pull it out. And so we aren't really being punitive of the company as long as we rearrange properly. Right? So again, if we don't rearrange and we just leave the interest expense in the statement, then yes, we are kind of counting at the cash flow, but then we're not getting a clean operating view of the firm because we're then essentially mixing in financing with non-financing. And so the, the real point of leasing is, the way leasing should be evaluated is, I need to buy an asset. Is it a better financing alternative for me to finance the asset by financing with debt or financing it through a lease? So I need to separate that choice out from I'm tying up capital to basically own an asset. And the accountants bias it so it actually is punitive to you. What's really punitive is to actually buy the asset. And the accountants advantage you to lease an asset because all that future lease liability doesn't show up on the balance sheet. So if they had capitalized the lease, then there's no 
there's no conversation because then the debt wouldn't be hidden. But since they don't capitalize the lease, that's the real problem that we have. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. But I, I saw uh, uh, these item on the balance sheet before. So why didn't they put it? So that is the accountant. No, the, the item on the balance sheet is. Actually, on, on the Google page. Yeah, no, it's on the Google page, but I'm saying even here, well, we go back to the Google page. It's it's not a capital lease. Oh, okay. Is that if it's a capital lease, that's what I was going to show you, then yes, the accounts say capitalized leases have to go onto the balance sheet, but operating leases do not. Okay. And so that's the point, is that they're not treated like capital leases, and Starbucks has $4.6 billion of operating leases. Right, but that's if you really think about it. Once those operating leases expire, they're going to renew them. It's not like those stores suddenly are going to go away in three to five years. They're going to sign on with the shopping center to keep the Starbucks stores going into the future. So, in a way, what they're doing is they're kind of getting a pass because they know that the accountants are going to treat this as an operating lease, even if they're going to keep that store there for thirty years. And so, it looks like they have less debt than they actually do. So I'm just saying we got to be careful of this when we look at our financing because companies are getting more sophisticated through not just this but derivatives at getting their liabilities off their balance sheet. So you can hire an investment bank to do a swap and I can swap stuff off. So it looks like I have assets but what I've done is I've swapped my debt for assets or I've swapped my assets for something else. And, and again, it's just as making sure that we get all of the claims that had to be paid before the shareholders are paid. That's what we got to look for. Yeah. How can companies be so smart doing stuff like that, but yet they can't just go through and get that to hire consultants to come in to help them with other things? I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you know, going back to like the cores <coughs> and bringing you on to. Yes. Well, part of it is they need an external messenger sometimes, uh -huh. because the internal people, for political reasons or whatever, can't. But also, I have to tell you that. <clears throat> what we're doing here, even in this class, though it sounds like common sense, and we're making it a point to try and make it easy enough to understand that it is sounding like common sense, is not what's taught in traditional financial valuation. In the traditional finance classes, they don't talk about taking operating and non-operating cash flows and spreading them out. So for the average person that just took a finance 101 in an MBA program, they don't get this. And I'll just tell you, the Smith MBAs here are not taught this as well. This is only stuff that's taught at a more sophisticated level. And, and as I'm saying, a lot of companies and the corporate finance people, they've just been taught DCF. They've, and then they're doing what they think is the right thing, and they're not thinking about the operating and non-operating. Now, if they were exposed to this, it would be pretty obvious. Same thing about leases. You know, A lot of investors don't look past the footnotes because they're just told all the liabilities are in the balance sheet. You know, And, and I'm just saying, people exploit that. <clears throat> they, they exploit people's biases. And, and we just have to be aware of that when we're valuing companies. And that's that's part of what I'm trying to show you here, is that we're not going to be perfect, but I'm just saying if you start to do this professionally, that's one of the reasons why it's actually important to go through the footnotes when you're doing valuation. You can't just use the income statement and the balance sheet because you're not getting the story. A good part of the story is in those footnotes. And until the accountants get better at putting the stuff in the footnotes on the actual statements, then life will be... Uh, hard for us or better depending on your perspective but the the real point is that I do think I've heard that the accounts are thinking about changing that rule where they're trying to make all leases capital leases and then there therefore all the leases show up on the balance sheet but companies are fighting this for obvious reasons okay anyways that's enterprise DCF valuation question yes so going back to what you said before about the capital was capital leases mm -hmm. um, being in the footnotes and that you said you gave them like five dollars a share that is missing out um, yep missing out as in we're undervaluing it by five dollars or we're overvaluing it by five dollars okay. a naive investor could overvalue starbucks by five dollars because you missed out on all those lease obligations that they have because most of those lease payments are financing financing costs and it should be treated like debt <clears throat> All right, discounted economic profit, methodology number two. Okay, So in the discounted economic profit methodology, the easiest way to see it 
is actually on the slide from the book when they did the Home Depot valuation. So what's key is that when we did the valuation, the valuation is the same with the exception for how we calculate the operating value. That's the only thing that's different. Okay. So here's the point. Economic profit is also known as the spread method. <clears throat> so to calculate economic profit, also known as EVA, we take the ROIC minus the WAC, the spread, and we multiply it by the invested capital. So invested capital times the spread is the value. And we talked about the concept of spread equals value. Spread of zero, no value. So zero times invested capital would be zero. Positive spread times invested capital, that positive amount in dollars is how much value is created. That positive amount, that negative amount in dollars is how much value is destroyed. That's economic profit. So what's different about the economic profit valuation methodology is we forecast the economic profits. What we then do is we discount the economic profits back to a present value. Okay, so we take the future change in values, the economic profits year by year, we discount them at the same WAC, same cost of capital as the DCF, and we get discounted economic profits, discounted change in value. We also do the same thing for the continuing value. Here's the change in value from 2019 going forward. Here's the present value, the change in value from 2019 going forward. So here's the change in value of Home Depot. Home Depot is going to add 25.6 billion dollars worth of value because of their positive spreads. Here's their starting invested capital, also is the current invested capital. So they have cumulatively spent book value, $37 billion of invested capital. They're adding 25.6 in the future. Add the two together, 62,694. That number should sound a little familiar because 62,694 is the same operating value as the DCF method. Right? So the point is, what do we get differently by doing a DCF versus an economic profit? If I do a DCF, I know that the operating value of Home Depot is 62,694. That's what I know, how much cash they'll generate. With the economic profit, here's what I now know. That Home Depot spent $37 billion of capital in its business and it added 25.6 billion dollars to what it's originally spent to get the operating value. So one of the things that the economic profit methodology tells me is whether or not a company is creating value just by spending assets or whether it's creating value by adding value to those assets or in some cases subtracting value from those assets and destroying value. So <clears throat> basically it tells me about the efficiency of the assets and whether or not I'm creating value. The other thing that the economic profit methodology tells me is when I am creating the value. And you can see that almost all of that value creation for Home Depot occurs after 2019. So the majority of that value creation comes more than a decade into the future. That's why, going back to expectations, when companies start changing their expectations slightly, and then we forecast these changes into the future. And it's that future value that has so, such a big important impact on the value of the company, it can really start to adjust the stock price. Right? But again, the economic profit methodology tells you when you're creating the value and how much value is being added. That's the insight of the second model. By the way, very quickly, APV. Here's what's different about APV. This is the same valuation for Home Depot. So let's assume you were doing an APV on Home Depot. What you would do is you would forecast out the same free cash flows as in the operating value. So that doesn't change. But here's what changes. You also forecast out the tax shields. So the interest tax shield is the interest rate or the interest dollars times the marginal tax rate. So that's the tax deductibility that you save by being able to deduct the interest as a cost of doing business. That's, good. That's called the interest tax yield. So here's the dollars of free cash flow, here's the dollars of interest tax yield. Then you use, instead of a WAC, you use a higher discount factor 
which is use the cost of the equity. And specifically, you use an unlevered cost of equity. Okay? And so with this higher discount rate, you discount both those cash flows at the cost of the equity, and that gets you a present value of those cash flows. Sum them up. 53,240 of operating value, 94,54 of value of interest tax yields. Add those two together, 62,694. Right? So here's the point. <clears throat> if Home Depot had no debt in their capital structure, what would be their operating value? It'd be 53,240. So Home Depot is getting value in their capital structure because the government, particularly the US government, the IRS, allows them to tax deduct the interest. So why do they have $9.4 billion worth of tax yields? It comes from the fact that they had almost $20 billion worth of debt equivalents and it was the interest and the tax deductibility on that that they were able to save. Okay, And this goes right back to your point about the leases because that's the idea and you can see that here is that what we're doing in the value of the leases is we're putting the value of the leases in the 9454 because that's the point. By being able to tax deduct the implied interest on the leases, it adds to the value of the firm, right? Because leases are tax deductible and the government is allowing us to tax deduct essentially implied interest, right? Because you go to a leasing company, they price it, not just the principal of the asset, they price it essentially as an amortized loan. And so therefore, most of the value of the lease is the interest, right? That's why, for example, if you lease a car, <clears throat> you know, you lease a $30,000 car for, for four years or three years that they're going to have a, a residual value at the end. And so what you're doing is you're financing a piece of the car, you're not financing the whole car, right? But you're still financing it and most of the payments are going to be the interest. So the same thing is, is true and all we're doing is we're saying this is the value of the tax shield. So essentially that's what we split out here. This is the value of the government allowing the tax deductibility of the interest tax yield, either in the implied value of the interest on the leases or in the value of the interest the savings on the debt from the tax yield. <clears throat> Does that make sense? I confuse Just you further. Sure I don't miss the implied piece. So when you actually calculate that interest tax yield, yep. So take 2009 as an example. That interest number comes from the financials. The interest number comes from the financials, but what you should theoretically do is you should capitalize the operating leases and break them into an interest portion and a principal portion. And so therefore, you put the principal portion on the balance sheet and the interest portion in the debt cash flow. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I understood your expectation of how we mechanically capitalize. I'm going to, for simplicity purposes, this semester in a very short spring session not have you do that I'm just gonna have you look at the interest on the interest tax yield and what I'm gonna say and this is not perfect so again sometimes I'll let us take some shortcuts but I'll just say that if we look at the value of the leases for Starbucks as an example and we capitalize those leases the vast majority of the four and a half billion would be interest so therefore rather than capitalize it and, and doing it separately, we're just going to arbitrarily assume that that's all interest, even though it's not. And it's probably four billion interest and five billion or 500 million capitalized lease. But rather than figuring it out, we're just going to essentially keep it simple. But you should technically, if you're doing this professionally, you should capitalize. Capitalize out the interest and then treat it separately. That's what McKinsey does, and that's what you see they do in the book. All right, back to this. So those are the three methods. This third method I just was showing you for illustrative purposes, but here's the thing. No matter which method you use, whether it's, and here's how they're doing the tax yield, by the way, 
<coughs> here's uh, the operating value is the same for APV as it is for economic profit, 62694, as it is for the DCF. So that's what I mean. You change your methodology, still have to get the same answer. It's just a question of what insight you get from the different methodology. So what I then want to spend the rest of our time on is setting you up for your next homework assignment, which is the conversion of the statements. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a quick five-minute break. And then we're going to come back and then we're going to talk through the statement conversion so that we can actually forecast the free cash flows by putting the statements into a format that gives us the free cash flows. So that's where we're going to go next. <coughs> 